Welcome, Pewter Report readers, viewers, and listeners to a brand new edition of the Pewter Report podcast, energized by Celsius, the official energy drink of PewterReport.com and the Pewter Report podcast. It is a Tuesday edition of the show, and we are talking about do the Bucks still rule the NFC South? We have a very special guest on the show today, formerly of the Tampa Bay Times and previously with The Athletic, now covering all of the NFC South with uh, Fox Sports. Greg Amon will be joining us very, very soon, so I'll give a more formal introduction once Greg is on. And also joining me on the show today, my fellow co-host, he's our BA. Uh, very happy to have him on the show Bailey Adams. Bailey, how are we doing? I'm doing well. It's good to be back on the show for the first time in a while. I'm glad, glad I could fill in here on this Tuesday. Yeah, very happy to have you on. Glad to uh, get you in front of the pewter people once again. Of course, Bailey, along with the rest of us, will be a big part of our Pewter Report draft show, which is coming up at the end of the month, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'll start with day one, but we'll be doing it day two and day three as well. The Pewter Report Draft Show presented by Celsius. You can find it right on our YouTube channel, Pewter Report TV. Please like and subscribe. We always have a very, very fun time when we do this. A lot of Bucks insights, some shenanigans as well. Some may remember <laughs> Josh Capo did the Will Levis Challenge by drinking uh, coffee <laughs> with a banana and mayo. Um, so who knows what type of challenge we'll do this year. I'm actually willing to take um, suggestions as well. But, yeah, that's just a heads up coming up later in the month, the Pewter Report draft show starting on that first Thursday for round one taking place on uh, April 25th, according to the graphic. All right, Bailey, a little bit of news before Greg Allman does join the show today. Um, we're in that stretch of the season where we're kind of just waiting for the draft and we will talk to Jason Light this week and a couple of Bucks players next week. So um, we do have that coming down the pipeline. Uh, but there was a recent article that we published on pewterreport.com. Pro Football Network, they ranked all 32 coaches in the NFL. And Todd Bowles, the T-O-double-D, was ranked as 21st overall um, by Pro Football Network. Fair, unfair how do you feel about said ranking? Because I think there's a lot of positives and negatives when it comes to Mr. Bowles. Yeah, I'd say probably pretty fair. I think maybe it could be maybe a few spots higher depending on who was ranked directly ahead of him. I can't recall off the top of my head. But it's it's kind of funny when you look at Todd Bowles' Bucks tenure so far through two years, 17 and 17 in the regular season. So you'd say – very, very average. Just right. Should be probably right in the middle. Maybe that early 20s is perfect. And uh, it, it is. It's funny because at the same time, he's won two division titles. And then a weak yeah. NFC South, <laughs> sure. We're talking about the NFC South today with Greg. But they've won two NFC South titles. This year, he got a playoff win. Um, and it's it's just kind of an interesting spot that he finds himself in. I think this year will be very, very important for him. But you can't really – for his faults, for his lack of timeout usage, for some of the things – in terms of his game management that have that a lot of people have issues with, and I think they're fair issues to have. He did, you know, keep this team together last year when they were four and seven. And he does deserve credit for being, you know, that steadying presence that kept them kept them afloat and got them back on track down the stretch of last season, got them to the playoffs, got them another NFC South title. And, you know, it's just funny how things change in Tampa because you know, years ago, winning the division at nine and eight would have been almost a dream. And now it's Todd Bowles getting, you know, no yeah. one's given credit for it. Um, so expectations have changed. But, um, yeah, I think 21 right around there, middle of the pack to, you know, maybe the lower 20s is probably the right spot for him. And this year he could he could raise um, raise his ranking and we'll uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, I, I think it's properly rated. I would maybe bump him down um, a little bit as well. Just because of what you said, Bailey, about um, winning the division titles. And I, I think that's what's kind of forgotten, too, is not even winning the division titles, but how it went last year, where the sky was falling at one point. It was really, really falling. So I think Bowles deserves a lot of credit for the fact that he kept everybody together. And let's remember, he still has his fastball. I know we got a lot of baseball fans uh, that will be on the show and in the chat as well. You know, Bowles 
showed that he still has his fastball as a defensive mastermind with what he did in that playoff game um, against the Philadelphia Eagles. So those are the positives. Some of the negatives, of course, the in-game decisions, the timeouts, I know drives Fox fans absolutely nuts. And I understand that, and I get that. I would also say sometimes maybe Todd has been a little bit too late to make some personnel decisions. For example, what if Yaya Diaby became a starter in October versus mm-hmm. kind of later on or, you know, giving Marquise Watts a little bit more time. So there, there's a couple of things, positives and negatives, where I do think 21 might be a little bit too high. He should be, I think, maybe get into those teens um, a little bit. But nonetheless, good, good food for thought, good food for discussion. All right. Now joining us on the show, we previewed it before. Fox Sports NFC South reporter. He was previously with the Tampa Bay Times and The Athletic. He's now covering all the division for Fox Sports, like I just said. We're very lucky to have him in the Fox Media Room. He's one of the best at what he does. And I'm not just saying that because he's also a fellow left-hander like I am. Ladies and gentlemen, joining the show, Greg Amon. Greg, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. How you doing? Good, guys. Good to be on with you. Hope you're doing well. The time of year we don't get to see you as much, so it's cool to see your faces. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we were just saying that before. It's a little bit of that that down period where we're kind of just getting inching closer to the draft, and of course, um, finding content here and there. Jason Light will be speaking on Thursday, so or yeah, on Thursday. So hopefully, I'll see you there and everything. But yeah. uh, Greg, for those that may not know you, um, which I think would be shocking at this point, but can you just tell us a little bit of uh, what you're doing over at Fox Sports and, and, and all of your coverage? Yeah, sure. Um, it's kind of an a, a odd setup, but we have divisional writers at Fox. So I cover the NFC South. Um, I'm still in Tampa, so it's still more Bucks than the other teams probably, uh, trying to make it up on the other teams. But yeah, Bucks, Falcons, Saints, Panthers, covering all four. Uh, this is a fun time of year to do it. Uh, this is my second draft in this job where you're kind of trying to keep track of all four yeah. teams. Um, I've done seven round mocks for, I guess the Bucks doesn't come out till tomorrow, but I, I filed okay. uh, seven <laughs> round mocks for all four teams. Uh, so you feel like you have a little bit of a sense for, for needs and it, it's not as much as if you were just focusing on one team uh, like you used to, uh, yeah. but it's fun. And, and you feel like, you know, four teams have a good sense of things where you're not necessarily going to be surprised by picks. Um, and they're kind of all over the map. Sometimes you get, they're all in one cluster, but Falcons are at eight, Saints are at 14, Bucks are at 26. Uh, Carolina didn't have a first round yep. pick. They're 33 and 39. But uh, yeah, it's like four different universes you're trying to keep track of, and you can't really be in all four at the same time. So, uh, but no, it's good. It's fun. I enjoy it. Yeah, it's it's definitely fascinating, and commend you for all the work that you do. Um, like I said, I, I think you do a fantastic job, not just with the Fox, but everything you else you've done with the NFC South. So we're gonna go through every single team, the division. We'll start with the Fox, and then we'll kind of go by. Sure. Uh, worst contender, which let's face it, is the Panthers, all the way to probably the biggest threat to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which most likely is the Falcons, but we can get into that discussion as well. So this has been a pretty big offseason for the Buccaneers. It's the offseason of re-signings, Baker Mayfield, Mike Evans, even their first, and I'll put in quotations, new free agent signing <laughs> was a guy that played for the Bucs previously right. won a Super Bowl with them with Jordan Whitehead. So Overall, just your um, opinion and thoughts on how the Bucs have really been able to navigate it this year. Yeah, I think they did really well. I mean, it's, it's a lot like right after the Super Bowl when the goal was to try and bring everybody back. And, and if yeah. anything, it's probably uh, better quality free agents maybe that they were in position to lose. Uh, you know, I think going into free agency, I know we tried to rank them at Fox, and I think it was like three of the top 15 free agents at any position. Um, looking at Baker, looking at Mike Evans, looking at Antoine Winfield. So it's one of those where um, – you know, I think Jason was kind of joking that if they brought them all back, if they could get all five back, yep. I think he included Winfield with a long-term deal. He'll, he'll he'll guard that he hasn't done that yet. But if he brought them all back, I think he was saying they should be throwing a Super Bowl parade. And I think he's done a really good job to do that. Um, they didn't have a, a huge amount of cap space to do this with. Um, they've done it without borrowing as heavily as they probably could have against future seasons. Um, I think they've done pretty good deals on things. You know, Baker... Everybody kind of wondered. I think there was so, you know, go back to like early March. There's people worried Baker's going to get, you know, 40 million a year or more. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, he was paid well. Mike Evans, I think they did really well on to get him for what's essentially two years and 41 million, um, especially seeing some of the deals that have come through since for what I feel are like lesser, yes, younger receivers. Um, and then Lamonte David being back. 
Mm-hmm. You know, at least McLaughlin being back. Um, and I think they've done a pretty good job in, in bargain signings to get guys like Randy Gregory and get some guards. Uh, Jordan Whitehead, you know, it's neat to see how excited they are to have him back. Uh, and that really seems like it fills a need and complements Antoine Winfield really well. So, no, I think they've done well. I mean, it's one of those where they, they could have been a little more active. I kind of wondered about a number two back or upgrading yeah. a tight end. There's, there's definitely some spots where, um, you know, you, you don't want to just bring the band back. You, you want to upgrade at positions. And I think they're uh, confident they can do that in the draft. And, and maybe even, I mean, there's still plenty of time to sign. There's lots of guys that are out there signing. Somebody had a list of, like, guys who are unsigned and will be starters in this league. And there's still good names out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think Jason's always done well. It's kind of like end game. Uh, when you think about, you know, the money has largely been spent and you're, you're picking through what's left some for better reasons than others. But I think he's done really well with that to, to find the guys. I mean, so much, you know, you think about all the big names that they signed this off season. I was struck by how much cheaper they were a year ago, you know, where again, Baker's yeah. making 33 million a year. Mm-hmm. He was you know, getting basically $7 million, even with incentives last year. Antoine Winfield, you know, made like one eight this past year. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chase McLaughlin is, I think, had a fifty thousand dollars signing bonus, which is like the best bargain you can you can get in free agency, pretty much. Um, so there's just a lot of those, and it's tough because to to do the same thing and to pay all those guys at market value makes it tougher to surround them with the same level of talent. So they do have to continue to draft well. They have to find these bargains and kind of, um, you know, you're not going to get an A list starter at every position. So it's yeah. You know, you think of it as kind of spackling and filling in holes, and that's not beautiful, but we think it'll work. Um, and they they do a pretty good job of hitting on those types. I mean, la- you think about last year, uh, you know, Ryan Neal did not hit on one of those. But you think Correct. about McLaughlin, you think about some of the other guys they got. And Shaq uh, Barrett was like the ultimate, like, yeah, yeah, let's take a chance on this guy and see what he can do. Right. And, and I mean, the more they do that, I think you kind of have confidence that you can do it again. Sorry, I've got a phone, oh, call. phone here. Um, I think when you've done that, it's not so crazy to think that, oh, Randy Gregory. Okay, Randy Gregory, you know, for $3 million, if he gives you eight sacks, that that's not bad in terms of, you know, he won't be mm-hmm. who Shaq Barrett was at his peak, but he could probably perform pretty close to what Shaq Barrett was last year and at considerably less. So, yeah, like I said, it's it's I don't think they're done, but I think they've done well to uh, keep the group together enough so that you feel like there's still the expectation when they say that the team to beat because they're a three-time division champ, mm-hmm. they're not just, you know, resting on, I mean, like a year ago when they said that you would have said, well, Brady left, you know, and those kind of things. And I don't think they have quite the same, this guy's gone, you know, they're missing Shaq Barrett. They're missing other players. Devin White not being back. It'll be new, but it won't necessarily be worse at the same time. Yeah. I think the key, what you just said all, of all that was the fact that they didn't have to borrow from future years is that, that yeah. they were able to do all of this within their constraints. And that's a huge credit to Mike Greenberg, Jackie Davidson, and, and the whole staff there. And I, I have seen, and I kind of get some of the criticism where some people are kind of hesitant to give them credit for bringing all of these people back because it's like, well, you're bringing these guys back and you're essentially the same 9-8 and eight team, team that was 4-7 and seven and right. needed that run at the end of the year. But at the same time, when you look at it in a vacuum and you look at the players they did bring back, and it's Mike Evans, it's Baker Mayfield, it's Levante David, obviously Antoine Winfield Jr., and then you know really reliable kicker in McLaughlin. Like, in all of those moves in a vacuum makes sense. So it's it's kind of almost twofold where you look at it like, yeah, this there does need to be a few more of those upgrades, and I think Jordan Whitehead is one of them. But when you when you look at the draft, I think that's where they're really going to have to hit and say, yeah, we are not the same team as we were last year. We're going to have some high impact rookies that can take us up to that next level. And a lot of it is, you know, I think within the realm of this division. Um, I think that plays a part too, is that they feel in this window right now, they can largely keep the group together, make some upgrades here and there and still feel like they're going to compete in this NFC South. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, again, that they're going to have a first place schedule working against them. They're going to have other things. You know, I think they'll wear the target of being the team to beat and get everybody's best game within the division. Yeah. Atlanta's going to come in with confidence and they should. Yeah. The saints can certainly know that they finished with the same record last year. If they don't, you know, they take care of business in one game. It's a whole different story coming out of New Orleans right now. Um, you know, Carolina will be better. I don't know if Carolina is going to set the world on fire this year, but I think it'll take a step in the right direction. Yeah, yeah uh, let's get into Carolina in, in just a moment. But before that, 
the last thing I want to say about like the Bucks free agency, because I do agree with you, Greg, in terms of like, it was a little surprising that outside of Chase Edmonds, they didn't try to bring in another running back, but maybe they'll sure. try to um, address that in, in the draft. Even that like wide receiver, I think will be very interesting because the, the Russell Gage experiment didn't work. And I don't even think that was anyone's fault. Like he obviously tore his ACL yeah. against the, the Jets in, in training camp and the season before he played through a lot of injury. But I do think, think that wide receiver three is going to be a little bit more important this year than maybe it was in the past because of Liam Cohen. He's going to play a lot more wide receiver three sets than I think they even did like last year with, with Dave Canales and um, and to a degree with the Bruce Arian style of offense. But that was different too because he had Mike, Chris, and Antonio Brown, three <laughs> insanely good wide receivers at the time. But I think the most important thing with the free agency and re-signing all these guys, I understand it's not new faces, but they didn't allow Baker to – hit the market. They did not allow Mike to hit the market. And the biggest thing with Baker, and this is how I wrote it back into the, the whole division, Baker is still the third highest paid quarterback in the NFC mm. South, Greg. Right. To yeah. me, I think that's one of the biggest accomplishments of all, especially with kind of how Derek Carr looked last year. And we'll see what happens with Kirk Cousins. Yeah. And it's one of those where I think what would help them a little bit is that Baker, because they trusted him, believed in him when not a lot of teams did last year. Yeah you get a little bit of, of a hookup on the other end. Like I think Baker, if he wanted to, could have made more money this year. Probably. Um, so I think it's a different sentiment than what you saw when Carr came into New Orleans a year ago and got, you know, basically three years and a hundred million. Um, and then this year with cousins, you know, you're, you're competing actively against the old team. So again, Atlanta did really well to get Kirk cousins, but they're paying him you know, so much more guaranteed, so much more in the first two years than the Bucks are with Baker, you would think they're going to be close in terms of results and production and, and, and leadership and all those things um, for, for Kirk Cousins to be $40 million better in the next two years. He'd have to really impress. He'd have to not show his age and not show yeah. he's coming off an injury. And he could very well be that he's the missing piece and that this, the Falcons, we talked a lot about being in the team that was just missing a quarterback last year. Mm. So I, I think Atlanta did well to get him even at a higher cost. But again, I, I think the Bucks helped themselves and they knew Baker wanted to stay. Uh, I think it's just a matter of, okay, what's the number you can give him that makes him feel valued and still allows you to surround him with talent. And it seemed like they did a, a good job of that. Yeah, uh, for sure. Absolutely. Now, one person Baker Mayfield will not have with him this season, of course, is new Carolina Panthers head coach, Dave Canales. So this is obviously the most direct connection. I mean, obviously the Falcons do with Raheem Morris and his history with the Buccaneers, but as far as this immediate team, um, no one's going to know the Bucs, at least offensively, better than Dave Canales. But uh, just curious if you were surprised that Canales got the job with Carolina, because I don't necessarily know if he was the, um, you know, the, the top guy that a lot of people thought of, especially with Brable and, and Belichick and other guys available at the time. And do you think it was mostly just a direct, hey, we saw what you did with Baker and Geno Smith. Now we want you to do this with Bryce Young as well. Yeah, I think what helped Dave Canales, and I was the same way. At first, uh, when he interviewed, it was like, wow, that's that's two huge leaps in two years to go yeah. to be a first-time coordinator, first-time play caller. And I think he did well, but I mean, the Bucks, it's not like the Bucs were top five, top ten in the league in most things. Um, I think they exceeded expectations. I think they weathered the, the post-Brady drop off well yes and then i think carolina probably recognized that their their team as it was they're probably not going to get the the a-list candidates um so you know what i think what i always felt like with dave canales is that uh, you dealt with him on a weekly basis you talked to him you knew what he was like I, I think if he got an interview he had a chance to really show people who he is in terms of relentless genuine positivity energy enthusiasm you kind of need that taken over a two-win team um that's a team that got beat up that hasn't had a coach for more than a year in a while so i think to bring him in um he's going to have the right attitude he's going to have the right approach he's going to handle whatever adversity comes in terms of not breaking out and being a nine-win team in year one or something like that and i do think like you said i think if you're trying to if your goal with this coach is to take a huge investment in Bryce Young and turn it around into the star you drafted him to be, he's got a really good record for that in the last two years in terms of just 
reclamation project guy. Yeah. Both to honestly, both Gino and, and Baker were high draft picks. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, again, Gino's not number one overall, but he got them to their very best football a at times in which other people had given up on them, multiple teams. Um, and again, Bryce, and I had a bad experience in year one. I think they've done a lot to set him up for better success in this second season um, to put 150 million into two guards overspending. If you have to, to get that O line back to a position of strength, to give them a chance to have a more balanced offense where you don't feel like so much weight is on Bryce Young's shoulders. Uh, they've already added a receiver in, in Deontay Johnson. I think they'll definitely add a, a receiver with one of those first two picks at 33 and 39 in the second round. Um, their defense uh, probably took a bigger hit than I expected to lose. I think it's four of their top six tacklers from a yeah. year ago. Uh, but they brought in some good guys too. Uh, so this, this was one of those where um, I think when you get to the off season, you have a new coach, a new GM, it's okay to want to maybe scorched earth rebrand a little more drastically than you want to. This was a team that struggled last year on both mm -hmm. sides of the ball. And for them to make the changes on defense that they did and be content to, to start and let Brian Burns go and let Frankie Louvu go and trade away Dante Jackson and bring in new safeties and new linebackers. Um, it's impressive. And it'll let them be legitimately a new team and a fresh start. Uh, there's not too much besides, Bryce Young, Derek Brown, J.C. Horn. You're really going to yeah. hang your head on and say, wow, that's that's a big carryover from that bad team. Uh, so, no, I, I don't know. You know, Dave Canales is, is an optimistic guy. He wants them to be competing this fall. Um, I don't know if that will happen. I think if they get anything more than about six or seven wins, it's going to be one of the better stories in the league this year. Uh, but I think they'll take a step forward, and, and I think Dave's the right guy to, to get them through that. And I, I think when you, when you do give up as much as they gave up to – draft Bryce Young number one overall last year I think they had to make that investment in him and build around him and get a coach in with that track record the one thing I think and like you mentioned about his his relentless positivity in that situation in an organization that has kind of been in a little bit of disarray over the years recently do you think that they're going to give him I mean I know they gave him a big a big long-term deal a big contract do you think that Dave Canales will get that patience and allow be allowed to kind of reset the culture there and kind of get a few years where they just show as long as they're showing significant or even a little bit less than significant improvement each year that he's going to stick around and the Panthers will actually be patient with him. Oh, I hope so. I mean, if yeah. they, if they <laughs> fire him this year, it's just one of those where there's, I mean, even if you're an owner that doesn't mind writing a big check and, and here's $20 million, sorry, it didn't work out. We're going to try and get with somebody else that that's their money. They can do what they want with it. Your reputation in the league starts taking a hit mm -hmm. and, and, and to where, guys that do have a choice in where they can go for a head coaching job are, are going to politely decline and not even interview or not even really take it seriously. So I think uh, if, if there's a world in which Dave Canales gets fired this year, it's got to be a really bad, like, like an Owen 17 mm -hmm. losing the team, Bryce upset, you know, in fighting. I, I don't think they have any of those things. I think this will be uh, a slightly better team that, that gets more of what they wanted Bryce to be, get some excitement built around that. Again, I, I don't know if they're going to be a touchdown a game better than they were a year ago. But I think, I mean, again, if he takes a step forward, if they're five and twelve, if they're six and eleven, if they're competing, if they're in their games, uh, that that's the right step forward. And if you move on from him, if you fired three coaches in three years, like I said, that that ownership is going to be, you're going to have coaches that write them off because they don't want to deal with that. E even if they're getting paid, even if it's like, don't worry, I'm giving you six years. Mm -hmm. As a guy who's been a coordinator for one year, that you can you can get somebody to listen to you running a big check. I don't I don't know that you can get somebody to sign with you every year doing it that way. Right. And and let's face it, David Tepper already doesn't have the best reputation for the number of firings <laughs> you just said, the you know, the incident he had last year throwing the drink. So he's not already on solid footing in terms of I guess the court of, of public opinion. Yeah. Uh, I was curious about some of the signings that they've made so far because while it is true, they did lose a lot of their big guys on defense, whether it's Frankie Louvu or they traded Brian Burns. While they've lost a number of players on defense, it does feel like they're kind of focusing right now on let's just build the offense. Obviously, quarterback's most important. There's not any breaking news to anybody here. But once we start figuring out the offense, then everything else can, can come in play. Because the first thing is protecting Bryce Young. He's not a little bit like Baker in terms of like not the biggest guy um, kind of needs that time and needs to look over some of the guys. So they, they uh, signed a couple of guards, Robert Hunt and 
Damian Lewis. And then I think the big thing, too, was getting Deontay Johnson, the wide receiver. I know he had his issues in, in Pittsburgh, but, I mean, Carolina had no one that they were throwing the football to last season. I think even that signing will make the slightest of differences. Right. I mean, you, you'd look at Carolina last year in their offense and in yards per attempt, okay? You won a nice number around seven or eight. Bryce had like four yards an attempt, like 3.8 yards an attempt, where there's just no downfield threat at all. Um, and, and I think Deontay Johnson gives him that. It, it's it's wild to look at his numbers and that he's been targeted like as much in his first four or five seasons. It's like top five in the last decade in the NFL. Just a, a huge volume receiver. Um, you know, had the one year where he had so many catches and so many targets and no touchdowns. But I thought he bounced back last year. Uh, again, it, it, it seems like a very low cost uh, opportunity for them to yeah. upgrade. You know, it's like I, I don't think that either Adam Thielen or DJ Shark really worked the way they wanted to last year. Mingo, as a rookie, I think he was 39 overall a year ago, had a low catch rate, went the whole year without a touchdown. That didn't really take – I don't want to write him off yet, but sure. they needed him to step up and act like a 50-60 catch receiver, and he really didn't. Um, so to add somebody, again, I, I've kind of got I, – I, I look at them, and I think they could use some size at receiver. I, I think Canales has to appreciate what he had with Metcalf in Seattle, what he had with Mike Evans here yeah. in Tampa. Neither of those guys are going to be there at 33. Don't get me wrong. I, I think Keon Coleman is a guy that is going to give him some size and, and be a great red zone target, a guy that can be a double digit touchdown receiver for them, uh, act like a number one receiver, and, and really help them take that offense to the next level. I, I don't know if they'll they'll go corner receiver, receiver corner, how they'll do 33 and 39. They're also in that nice spot where that first pick of the second day. Sometimes you can get a really nice offer where you'll pick up a a third round pick or a few. Yeah, exactly. Somebody realizes there's somebody that shouldn't be there at 33. They have enough needs where they should listen to take those calls, uh, especially with the depth at receiver. If they're looking to go receiver at 33, they can pick up one more impact player and still get the next receiver on the list at, at 36 or something. Uh, that'd be probably smart for them to, to take that trade. Since we're talking about receivers and the Panthers receivers, just throwing this out there, he's not a guy that's going to bring him a lot of size, not going to be at the top of the depth chart, but how obvious of a signing was David Moore um, once oh, yeah. once Canales went to went to Carolina? How obvious <laughs> was that? Anyway, it's like I, I, I would message the agent, and I was like, eh, any reason this hasn't happened? Like, this makes a lot of sense. Um, and mm-hmm. it's one of those where they brought back a lot of the uh, practice squad fringe types after the year. Um, and could have done that with David Moore. Again, David Moore like spent most of last season on the practice squad, like wasn't mm-hmm. beating out undrafted rookies and stuff like that. But again, his connection wasn't with the Bucks. His connection was to Canals and Brad Idzik and was with them in Seattle, yeah. had his best years in Seattle, yeah. uh, had two huge catches down the stretch. I, I can't say enough in terms of a guy stepping up and making plays at the end there. That, that's kind of what it was. It was kind of that Brashad Perriman type thing where you step yeah. up, you make some amazing plays, but you're not somebody they're probably going to lean on as a wide receiver three or wide receiver four. So I think he'll bring a maturity, a leadership, uh, a guy who's won places before, knows exactly what Idzik and Canales want from receivers, from players. Uh, he'll do the same thing he kind of did in Tampa. I don't know if he was really mm-hmm. fully appreciated, but as the the wise old leader of the receiver room, they have great leaders here in, in Mike and Chris, but just guys that can – talk to the young guys and and let them know what this exact offense entails. He'll do the same thing in Carolina. Even if he's wide receiver five, wide receiver six, if he has 15 catches in the season, he'll make the room better there. Yeah. Yeah, I I think there were times last season where, you know, Trey Palmer down the stretch, and I still think there's a lot of upside for Trey Palmer, but you know, towards the end, he had a couple of fumbling issues and dropped the ball occasionally where they relied on David Moore, a tad bit, uh, especially like, you know, the green Bay game, he made the big play and, um, I know Trey Palmer also made a big play in the, in the playoff game, but so did David Moore. And there were times where they turned to David Moore later in the season because maybe they didn't trust anyone else. Like Devin Tompkins was more of just an end around guy more than anything else. So I, I do agree. I do think he was a bit underappreciated. Now, this next thing I'm going to talk about is greatly appreciated. And that, of course, is the great Celsius energy drinks, the official energy drink of pewterreport.com and the pewter Report podcast check out their new line of celsius energy drinks it's the celsius essentials these are the tall boys they have 270 milligrams of caffeine so it packs a little bit of an extra punch uh, when you have a celsius energy drink they got great flavors like the blue crush and the dragon berry can't forget about the og flavors of celsius either whether it's an arctic vibe my personal favorite the strawberry lemonade 
is great as well. There's tons of awesome flavors of Celsius. So if you need to know where to find a Celsius energy drink, maybe you're in Atlanta or Carolina or somewhere else covering the NFC South, you go to the Celsius store locator, punch in your address, and I'll tell you the closest geographical location where you could pick one up. Could be a Walmart, Target, 7-Eleven, health and fitness store. If you're lucky enough, it might just be your bodega. So if you love Celsius, after you try it out and you're like, I love this so much, I want to get it in bulk, you can get it in bulk. I'd recommend getting that variety pack because variety is the spice of life. And you heard me talk about all these great flavors of Celsius. Go to Amazon, click on the subscribe and save, and uh, you can have it sent to your place of residence whenever you want. You're in charge. You're the captain now. Just make sure you're drinking Celsius energy drinks. Make Celsius your number one pick during the draft season. Celsius, the official energy drink of the Peter Report podcast. Before we um, head on over to, <laughs> I try, listen, Mark Cook was the greatest at transitions and segues, and you've been on mm. with Mark before. Um, I tried to do it in his honor to make some good segues. So. Absolutely. That was my you did it proud there. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Um, we got a super chat, by the way. So shout out to Mark Fisher, a.k.a. Redfish. Uh, thanks for the nine ninety nine super chat. If you super chat us, we'll talk about really whatever you want to talk about. So he says, do the Bucks rule? Do you feel Baker hit his ceiling last year? Does Mike slip? How's the pass rush? And who will be better with it? And uh, though we were champs, does Greg feel we were actually the best NFC South team? A lot to unpack there, Greg. Why don't we start with the last part where he specifically asked for you if if you felt the the Bucks were the best NFC South team? I think so. They were the best down the stretch. You know, it's one of those yeah. where you know you look. The Saints were right there with them, kind of let some games get away. Atlanta was so frustrating. And Atlanta, I think, went two and six against teams yeah. with losing records. Uh, lost to like three of the four worst teams in the league. Um, and I had thought their defense was going to be good enough to to keep them in the hunt. They, they just got so little from their offense, from their quarterback in general. So I think part of the reason that people are as excited as they are now is thinking that they'll be the team that they weren't a year ago. Um, the idea that Kirk Cousins can get more out of Drake London and Kyle Pitts and Bijan Robinson and whoever else they add here uh, in the next couple of weeks. But no, I don't know. It's one of those where I still think, like I was in Vegas a couple of weeks ago, and the line's there. I mean, Atlanta is a even odds favorite to win the mm -hmm. South. I mean, yeah. you get a dollar, you get a dollar. Uh, wherein the Bucks are, are like 2.7 or 3 to 1. Saints are like 3.5 to 1. Carolina is like 12 to 1, 14 to 1. Long shot there, obviously. But I'm surprised that, that I think that's just the Kirk Cousins excitement, uh, shiny yeah. new toy kind of thing. <clears throat> so, yeah, right now it's hard to say. I mean, I think, uh, I think Atlanta can be a playoff team for sure. Like if they're not winning the division, I feel like this is a division now that can yield a, a 9 and 8 or a 10 and 7 mm -hmm. wild card or something like that. Uh, I think the Bucs are still right there. I mean, again, the the division, these division games, okay, you think about, you know, the Bucs uh, splitting and not dominating the division in league. They, they still won enough games to make up for the fact that they went 0-3 in their first place games. Um, they're going to have to do that again, probably. Like, if they go 1-2 and two in those three games, that's going to be a win for them. Um, I do think the division is facing a little bit of tougher things, like having a number two schedule, you're still facing some really good teams. Yeah. Carolina's mm -hmm. last place, and they get, like, Cincinnati, Arizona, and Chicago, which could – I mean, if you're doing, like, three of the most improved teams in the league, they're probably high on the list. Uh, yeah. So, no, like I said, I, I still think it's a, a tightly packed division. I don't expect anybody to win it by two or three games. Um, it's going to come down to division games down the stretch, and, yeah. and that's what the Bucks did to win last year. Yeah, and where I really think it swung was that that December game in Atlanta it was just the the last minute comeback that the Bucks had that right. swung it. And I mean, the Bucks did play well down the stretch outside of the slip up against New Orleans, but it was that game I think that at the time turned the division lead to the Bucks, and they didn't let go of it. And it could be as finest margins as that as a game where you know that game could have gone either way. It ended up going the Bucks way, and they you know took care of business the rest of the way. But it is that kind of, you know, the top three teams in this division, you know, the the Bucks, the Falcons, and the Saints, you know, save for Carolina. I think those three are going to still probably be pretty tight, um, you know, this year. I think they're all, all kind of almost on even footing, which is the the funny part of this division. As, as bad as people view this division, there are three teams that are, yeah. you know, right around the same level. Yeah, I don't think you can rule out the Saints um, at all because they've really been a thorn in the side of the Bucks. I mean, even going back to Tom Brady's first season – uh, coming to Tampa Bay and 
Greg, I can't wrap my head around the Saints because every year they do all these crazy like restructures and somehow find a way to get under the salary cap. And, um, you know, they, they do get kind of older each year. And the past couple of years, really ever since Drew Brees left, it felt like, up. Oh, it's time for the Saints to, to rebuild. It's time for them to just break it down and build it back up all over again. And yet they stay afloat and they obviously haven't been fantastic, but they've still found a way to be in the playoff hunt to the last week of the season. How do they do it? Yeah, they, they do. I mean, I, they have a different kind of cap gymnastics than the Bucks do every year. But again, like this offseason, I had thought they were going to have to trade Latibor or trade Kamara. Um, they're fortunate in that these players that they've been kind of locked into as a result of all these restructures and cap moves they've made have not shown their age. And Demario Davis continues to play at a very high level. And Cam Jordan took a step back last year, but has been a really good player for a guy his age. Uh, their offensive line, I think, is a major question mark. I think they have to put that 14 pick into a tackle and have to hope he has an, an immediate catch on and and be a week one starter type because Trevor Penning hasn't been the answer. Ramchick's got a knee injury that's probably yeah. not going to go away. Um, they've got some real question marks there. So, um, you know, I think New Orleans is probably in third right now, but I think they're they're right there. They'll have the confidence of knowing that they finished with the same record as the league champs. They have an easier schedule to get there if they do it again. Uh, and like I said, they've, they've kind of held on to the right key leaders on that defense. Um, you know, Dennis Allen is a coach who probably is in the same boat that Todd Bowles was, and Todd Bowles is, where if he doesn't take a step forward, if he doesn't at least repeat that, that record, he's going to be in trouble. So there's an urgency to that as well. Uh, I don't think this division is going to have any kind of wire-to-wire champ. I think the team that's in first place in week four might not be the team that's in first place in week eight. A lot like this past year. I mean, when the Bucks were four and seven, they they didn't look like a team that was going to do this. Um, so you know, you don't know how a first year coach is going to immediately take in Atlanta with Raheem Morris. I think he's going to do a great job there. I don't know if it's going to show up in year one. Um, so there's lots of questions, and it makes it again. I, I feel like this division, a lot like last year, wasn't great, but it was really close and really unpredictable. And that's a fun thing to have with your Covenant division is not really knowing what's going to happen from week to week. That's something I'm so curious about with Dennis Allen is probably being in the same situation as Todd Bowles. I mean, went nine and eight last year, but hasn't made the playoffs the last two years. And the Saints, you know, for for as much as they do all these gymnastics, like their expectation going into every year is that they still run the division. That's what they that's what they believe. But say it doesn't work out for them this year and Dennis Allen is gone and they bring in a new head coach. Is at that point, are they going to keep up with this strategy that they're doing? Or at some point, like how much longer can they keep going with this same kind of, you know, not not you know, refusing to rebuild and then you know every, it's again next year it's just these guys are going to be a year older are they going to be able to do it again next year or is it when does it end yeah the trick the hard part is that with these cap deals it's kind of like uh restructuring begets more restructuring if you will and they have so much dead money locked up in so much contracts you really can't you'd love to just purge and outright cut and cut this mm -hmm. guy and cut that guy yeah. because you have guys that have like a 20 million dollar cap hit and aren't playing to that level it's just you can't. It's kind of like if you cut them, all those void years, all those future prorations come accelerated now, and you didn't even save money by cutting the guy. Um, they, they've done that a little bit. They've gotten guys to take pay cuts. I, I do think if, if they were bad enough this year, if they disappointed and made it change a head coach, you want to be able to get younger. That's the main thing. Uh, they're, they're already way over the cap for next year. They're going to have to do the same crazy resets and and renegotiations and restructures that that have gotten them again they're getting good at doing this don't get me wrong but um part of the reason i think they kept dennis allen and part of the reason i think they didn't make a change is that it, it's not necessarily what you want to come into as a new coach you don't want to come in and know hey you have to inherit about 80 percent of this team and you're not going to be able to spend a lot in free agency like carolina to their credit has i think 12 new signings okay they, they've been able to bring in guys specifically for their scheme, for this coaching staff, for this team. With New Orleans, they haven't been able to do that. They've added a couple of receivers. They've added Chase Young, who may or may not be healthy when their season starts, added Willie Gay. Uh, but they haven't been able to make the the wholesale bring in, fill your main needs. They, they've still got holes as a result of the limited flexibility. It's, it's a lot like what the Bucks had a yeah. year ago or two years ago where you're doing stuff in free agency, but you're not out there writing big checks by any means at all. And one of the, the moves they made this 
offseason was letting go of Michael Thomas. Uh, I think a lot of people may remember he kind of went off on social media about it um, for a little moment there. How do you look at the wide receiver room for the Saints? Is is wide receiver going to be one of the top options for them uh, in the first round or in the second round? Because, um, you know, outside of their top guy there, I don't necessarily – it's not ex- exactly the most daunting room as it once was. Yeah. Right. And I went through, I mean, I think, I think there's two solid receivers. I think Chris Alave and Rashid Shahid are both great receivers. I think that's a good yeah. starting point. I think there's a drop off to go from there to, I mean, right now it'd be AT Perry or some of the guys they brought in said Wilson brought in uh, Stanley Morgan. Um, I think those are more veteran types backups, not, not going to give you 800 yards and eight touchdowns or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So I, I would think they are a team that very much adds in receiver at some point in this draft. I don't, I do not think it would be as high as as fourteen, um, but like second day receiver. I'm, I'm trying to go back and I've got like too many notepads here where I don't even know where I'm at. But uh, I would not be surprised at all if they put a second day pick into a receiver. Uh, I think they could get a tight end just because they're they have a lot of tight ends, but not necessarily a lot of young tight ends, right. a lot of number types. So I, I think that's position they get into. Um, you know, they put a third round pick into a running back, so I don't necessarily know that they'll add another running back. But uh, they have to get younger at some point here on offense. And it, it's one of those where receiver depth, um, they have about five, you know, they're going to keep. But I do think there'll be a rookie who should wedge in there right around receiver three for them and help them out that way. And, of course, what's also very important is the man that's going to be throwing them the football. And, uh, you know, there's no more Jameis Winston as the backup quarterback. Uh, not that, you know, it was always Derek Carr's job anyway because of that contract he was gotten. But so – fascinating watching Derek Carr because at times I think it was like abysmal then there were times he looked great so I guess how would you describe his season last year and what are your thoughts about what he can do this season yeah I feel like Derek Carr really helped himself in the last four games of the season um there was a stretch there maybe around Thanksgiving where he didn't seem to have the locker room uh there's infighting with linemen there's infighting with receivers yeah and his last four I forget the numbers I think it's 10 touchdowns and one pick in his last four and that kind of took him from what was looked like a clear disappointment of a season to, uh, okay, no, actually, you know, that that's about what you should have expected from Derek Carr. Touchdown interceptions, decent yards, uh, kept them in games that sometimes they weren't in. Um, you know, because at Thanksgiving, you wondered, like, gosh, could they get out of this contract? Like, you had the same kind of conversations Denver was having about Russell Wilson, some of these other teams that have a lot financially – locked into their quarterback they couldn't get out of Derek Carr they yeah. had to do something but maybe he's not the guy maybe you have to put a, a, a high draft pick in and I think what he did in that last month I think they go three and one maybe in that stretch beat the daylights out of Atlanta in the last game uh I, I think it let him end on a positive upswing and I think as a result uh it, it, there's no question he's the guy there you know and they restructured him where he's actually probably now the guy in 25 there too mm. uh that's fine if he if he can have an entire season like you finished last year, they're going to be really pleased with him. Um, I had, I'm looking here, and I had, uh, when I was looking at receiver for them, um, like I said, 45, their second pick is 45 overall. They need edges too, man, because their pass rush took a big step back. Uh, Cameron Jordan's going to be like 35 years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, Again, Chase Young, if he's healthy, could really be a, a, a great, low risk signing for them, but that's still an if, and that's still a short term solution. So I actually had them holding off on receiver until way later uh, in the draft. Now that I look at it, um, the one I mentioned actually, that would be fun. Uh, I had a fourth round going to Luke McCaffrey uh, out of rice. Uh, yeah. just a new offensive coordinator, Clint Kubiak. Uh, his dad coached Ed McCaffrey, Clint Kubiak coached Christian McCaffrey last year. Mm. Those two families are, intertwined in multiple generations. Um, and I think McCaffrey is a guy like a value pick, like a fourth round type pick uh, could be really good for them and, and kind of carry the family name uh, there with the Kubiaks. That's who I was thinking of there, but yeah, they car. If you, if you take car on balance and give him kind of a, uh, a gimme year, a mulligan year in terms of just taking hold of a team. Um, I think he did a really good job at the end of the year. And I think if he can carry the locker room, and the nice thing about, you kind of compared Carr and Mayfield throughout last season. And I think Baker did a much better job. But even when he wasn't playing well, he had that locker room. And he yeah, had one them over from the start. It's one of those where maybe because he didn't get in the job right away and had to win it kind of in July and August. Um, I felt like that was the biggest difference is that Carr 
even when he played well, you weren't sure if he really had that team believing in him. And I think he went a long way, even though he didn't win a division title, in finishing strong to help himself in that department. I almost kind of wonder last year, because there were a couple of times where he got really banged up and you thought, okay, well, this yeah. is the week where he's going to need to be out and Jameis is going to have to step in. And then he'd, get, he'd come back and play. He was like, you know, the Black Knight and Monty Python. He was like, I, right. he would always show up and play and sometimes he wouldn't play well. Um, and I almost wonder if one of those games, if if he would have taken a step back and Jameis would have played, if that if they win a game that they have lost and that flips the division, I don't know. But right, well, and just... Carr, yeah, Carr like Mayfield is not a guy who wants to come out. So I think yeah. there were two different weeks last year where he left a game with a concussion and played the next week. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it's not a toughness issue at all. I think it's yeah. somewhere he again that shoulder he played through uh, shoulder issues, played through again, you know, at least one concussion. Um, and again, mm. that's the kind of thing. Again, Baker did the same thing. Where Baker, yeah. again, we, we had body parts we weren't even sure were listed on the injury. Yeah, report. Right. <laughs> and if you ask him, he's like, "No, I'm fine." Like, well, why are you yeah. even asking me? Like, <laughs> yeah. Every you... every day of practice was like its own adventure. Like, what's he going to do? Is he even going to be out there? Like, what, what's going on? So, uh, yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, we're about to talk about the Falcons in just a moment, but wanted to bring this up. Um, Scott's not on the show today, but he asked me. He uh, wanted me to mention this to you as well. Um, Greg, you've been a big advocate of going to get screenings for skin cancer and, and, and things like that. And Scott actually said that he, one of the most recent times he went, he went because of, you know, your advocacy and, and talking about it. So can you just briefly just talk about your own, you know, past with it? And yeah. obviously you had a message on social media a couple of years ago about it. And I think it resonated with a lot of people. Oh, no, I appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, and it's a great message. Um, it's not something I would have thought about bringing up on here, but it's great. Um, I, I was really fortunate. I had, uh, as you know, I have not as much coverage on top as some of us do um, to where if I'm at the beach, there's a big old floppy hat like in mini camp. Uh, I got a long sleeve uh, rash guard I'm wearing where there's about two or three square inches of actual skin that sees the sun when I'm at the beach. Uh, but I was really fortunate. Um, it's like my dad would get stuff lasered and zapped on his head all the time. Mm -hmm. And kind of stay on top of it. Um, I've got a guy named Glenn McLean uh, at Florida Medical Clinic. Does a great job. Uh, I was going in twice a year to get checked before I had any problems. And then uh, 19, um, I got diagnosed again, very like literally base level. I say cancer, but really they caught it early enough. It barely counts. So I've got a, a decent scar on my cheek here um, where they had to take out a, a portion of my cheek. Uh, came back again, got it right away. Can't go better. I had another, I've got another one right under my kind of sideburn here mm -hmm. where they, they had to take it out a couple of years ago. Uh, but again, I've been really fortunate in that by going in there, I go in there now every six months. I was every three months for the first five years uh, after I, I got the initial one uh, taken out. Uh, again, it's, it's just really great. In this state, yeah. sunshine, even if you're just in your car, they talk about how the left side of your face yeah. if you're driving is so much more uh, prevalent to get skin cancers because the sun when you're driving around Florida is there. Anything that looks unusual, anything that changes color or shape, it's so easy to go in and get checked out. Yeah. Um, the, the sooner you go in and get yourself checked, uh, the much, the much, much better your odds are of beating it and just being able to laugh and have a silly scar on your face five years later. So yeah, Scott brings up a good point. And again, there's there's lots of people that can benefit from this. If if you have anything you're worried about, uh, these skin checks, it, it's just easy. They give yeah. you a gown. You're you're wearing the gown, and they they'll check, and it's awesome. I've got. I got stuff that I check and I'm worried about. I got a mole behind this ear that I worry about, but he says, Oh, that's fine. He'll say, Oh, this is a thrombosis and this is a such and such. Yeah. And it's, it's uh, it's a great peace of mind just to know, even though you got a couple of things that are it's a strawberry here and you got a coloring here. Um, he'll tell you you're fine. Um, I went, I had something on, on the top on the back that was kind of had a, a texture I didn't like. And, uh, they'll, they don't even have to do surgery. Sometimes they just have like the, uh, the nitrogen and it's like the coldest oh, wow. thing in the world and they'll just and spray it mm -hmm. and freeze the daylights out of your skull for a sec and it it knocks it out um so again that was that was the simplest solution there to do that but uh yeah like i said scott brings up a good point yeah in this state of florida uh we love our sunshine we love being able to go to the beach and be outdoors but in doing so you got to be really careful about your skin uh, and make sure we're around to enjoy it for uh, years and years more yeah. No, appreciate you uh, telling your story. I think it's uh, important yep. for a lot of people. And yeah, Florida, obviously, Sunshine State for a reason. So make sure you get checked if you're thinking about anything. Um, 
really no good transition to talk about the Atlanta right? Falcons. <laughs> Speaking of things you should be concerned about. Yes, yeah. there, you, <laughs> there go. you go. Thank you. Thank you things you should be concerned about. Arguably the biggest move in free agency this year was Kirk Cousins uh, taking his chain and everything and going to Atlanta now. Um, big time contract, $180 million, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Everyone was saying the Falcons need a quarterback. So there's no question that the Falcons got better with Kirk Cousins as their quarterback. But how great can they be? And I'm also just curious, like, how much better – is this Falcons team with Kirk Cousins than, say, the Vikings team that Kirk Cousins just left? Because he had Justin Jefferson as his number one wide receiver. Right. Yeah, that's the question. And there's a little bit of a Derek Carr feel to it, too, in that Kirk Cousins has had like nine 4,000-yard seasons, just a consistently prolific passer, uh, and has one, one playoff win, and that's it. And, you know, Derek Carr had one playoff game and a loss at that. So – there's definitely that sense that uh, there's a lot of criticism in Atlanta. Like, oh, well, he's going to be great, and you're going to be out in the first round of the playoffs. I Atlanta would probably be cool with that, honestly, in that they've gone, you know, they've gone six years now without making the playoffs. They they haven't really had that post Matt Ryan uh, answer at quarterback. Um, you know, tried a little bit with Mariota and, and yeah. Ritter, obviously. And this is the first uh, big swing. This is definitely let's write a big check. Let's go get the absolute best quarterback available. And instead of the inaction of last year, let, let's just take a big swing, you know, and go with it. So uh, kudos to them, because like I said, it does that. I mean, again, he's 35. He's coming off a torn Achilles. There are question marks. But I think in terms of having the same effect that Derek Carr did trying to take over for Drew Brees a couple a couple years later, I think it's had that desired effect where there's an excitement in Atlanta. There's a buzz about the team. I think they're they're probably one of the most improved teams in terms of the expectations. Um, it's like they're, I forget what their over under was on wins, but it was, it was crazy high. It was like fifth highest in the NFL or something oh, like wow. that to where I think they even pulled it down. Like enough people took it where they should, they went down from 10, five to like 10 wins for the season, if you will. Um, there's a lot of new pieces there, new quarterback, new head coach who hasn't been a head coach Raheem. in a decade. I, I like Raheem Morris again. He's doing something he has done in a while. A new offensive coordinator, first time play caller, new defensive coordinator coming back into the league after being uh, out of the game and then was an assistant in, in the Rams. So it, you just don't know how well all that comes together. There's some great minds on both sides of the ball. Um, they just started their offseason program a week ago and like they showed a five minute clip of, of Ra leading that team in his first meeting. And you can see why people love him and people are, are drawn to him and have such high hopes for him. It's just a matter of whether it shakes out this first year or not. You know, I think if, if Cousins can be back and can play at the level he was for the first, whatever it was, seven, eight games before he got hurt last year, they can be a really dangerous team. Um, they have the offensive weaponry. I think the gripe for three years with Arthur Smith was just not taking advantage of it and not uh, getting more out of Kyle Pitts and not getting more even out of B. John Robinson, who had a ton of touches. They didn't really use him in the red zone as much as they could. Um you know, they've added some pieces. They added Darnell Mooney. They've added uh, Ray Ray uh, from the Niners. They've added a bunch wow, of pieces. Yeah. So I feel like they've they've done a good job, um, you know, lost a tight end, picked up a tight end. They'll be a, a good team on both sides of the ball. It's just a matter of, of how it comes together and how it takes. Um, but I think there's every reason for the excitement and the optimism that they have around this team. Um, fixing the one glaring problem they had at quarterback and, and bringing in, you know, a really proven commodity in, in Kirk Cousins. So having done that, what do you think right now, I guess, going into the into the draft in a couple of weeks, where where is that big area where that's the, you know, the spot they need to upgrade to actually feel like, all right, we figured out quarterback. Now we need to make sure this other thing doesn't, you know, isn't our new, our new downfall. Definitely pass rush. It's absolutely yeah. pass rush. Uh, they, they've been hurting. Uh, in terms of their sack levels, they stepped up a little bit with a new defense coordinator. Didn't necessarily have, I think they've gone the longest without a 10 sack season of any team in the NFL. You go back to like Vic Beasley, I think it is Ooh. in like 2016, uh, way too long without one. So that eight pick that they have, as much as they've had all this high fantasy football, high level, three straight top 10 picks on offense, they've got to go defense. Mm -hmm. They, if they do it right at eight, they're going to have their pick of any defensive player on the board. I think it's probably Dallas Turner from Alabama. I think he's the best pass rusher in the draft. He's what they need. Um, and that's with them not bringing everybody back from last year. Calais Campbell isn't necessarily back. Um, Bud Dupree isn't necessarily back. So they're, 
they're not at full strength up front right now. They'll get Grady Jarrett back, which is a huge thing for them. Uh, to add him back in the middle of that defense. But like I said, they need a pass rusher. They need to get their sacks up. Um, I, I think Dallas Turner will be that guy. Uh, they can, they can, if they really wanted to, if there's quarterback needy teams that still haven't got their guy in the first seven picks, I think they could slide down a little bit just because they might be able to slide down to like 11 and still get the first pass rusher in this draft. Uh, but they've got to put that pick in. As, as much as there are other issues around that team, that's that to me is the obvious need, and it matches up really well with the best in this class. Uh, last one for me, and we really appreciate all your time, Greg. Um, you mentioned Raheem Morris a, a moment ago that he hasn't been a head coach in a while. Um, he obviously has been around the league, coached a couple different positions. How much of a concern, or how much should we be, be paying a, attention to for the fact that it's been a while since he was a head coach? It's almost a little slightly similar to like Todd Bowles when he coached with the Jets, and then you know worked with uh, with Bruce Arians, and then he got his head coaching opportunity. And we kind of began this show with the positives and negatives of of Todd Bowles. I'm curious about that with Raheem Morris as well. Yeah, it's funny. Like, it's the longest break between head coaching stints. It's the second longest in the Super Bowl era. Uh, Dick Vermeil, when he came back with the Rams, is the only one that's longer. Hmm. Um, and again, he, he's been around. I mean, Vermeil left. He was retired. He's been around good teams. He's coached on both sides of the ball, was an offensive assistant with the Falcons. Obviously, he was part of some great championship-level teams with, with the Rams. Uh, so he's been there. I mean, I think it's one of those where you think about Atlanta and you think about just as they needed a coach, just, need, just as they needed a quarterback and they got then Kirk Cousins, I really think they needed a charismatic, likable, yeah, uh, new face of this team in a coaching standpoint. I think Arthur Smith, um, God love him, didn't do a lot to try and ingratiate himself with the people of Atlanta to make him be somebody they believed in. I think it was more the opposite. I mean – Raheem is a, is just an eminently likable guy. And I think Arthur Smith was more concerned with proving that you were wrong and that he was smarter and it didn't always show up in the scoreboard. Uh, Ross, just a, like I said, a guy that still projects being much younger than he is um, mm -hmm. to talk to him. There's, there's an engagement and enthusiasm and an energy uh, that I think really connects well with players. And I think he'll have that on both sides of the ball. Uh, again, like we don't know how much the game has changed on him. I think yeah. he has a good staff um, to be a, a coming back in as a new head coach and still trust somebody enough to give them the keys, kind of like like Bowles did with Canales a year ago. Uh, Zach Robinson's a young coach, and he comes from the absolute best tree you want to pluck a guy from right now. But that's some uncertainty there. Uh, Jimmy Lake, again, great coach, was yep. here in Tampa, um, had some success in Washington, cultivated a lot of the players that are here on this Bucks roster now. And then trailed off and was kind of had a year where he was just kind of hanging out the Ram staff working there. Uh, but he's a guy that has been a great defensive mind in this league before. Um, so I'm intrigued. It's, it's, it's brand new. There's still a, a really good core there when you think about the Gritty Jarrett's and the Jesse Bates and sure. the offensive line with guys like McGarry and Lindstrom. Um, they've done a lot to keep some continuity where they need it as well while bringing in a lot of new pieces to this Atlanta team. Yeah, it's kind of the tough nature at times with uh, NFL coaches that you're going to travel around to a lot of different places. So it's important to have a great realtor, and there's no better realtor in the Tampa Bay area than Eric Gross and the Eric Gross Group. It takes a full team to win a football game, and it takes a full team effort to win in real estate. The Eric Gross Group has done hundreds of transactions in this crazy real estate market and has experience in all types of situations. Eric is an avid Pewter Report reader. He's been on the podcast a couple of times, and his father was stationed in the McDill, McDill sorry, Air Force Base. He and his team have the market knowledge, top-notch communication, and commitment to excellent service that sets them apart. With a strong team of vendors and a network of 85,000 agents, the Eric Gross Group will turn your dream of buying or selling a home into a reality. Let the Eric Gross Group take the pressure off. Find them on Facebook and Instagram at Eric Gross Group. Check out their website, housesinfla.com, or give them a call at 513-907-4271. That's housesinfla.com, and their number is 513-907-4271. No matter where you are on your home ownership journey, you'll feel welcome with the Eric Gross Group, the official realtor of pewterreport.com. Uh, we got one more super chat to get to, like I said. Greg, you've been extremely gracious with your time. Um, sure. So if we could just get this last one real quick. Paul, a.k.a. Florida Dreamhouse, thank you for the $5 super chat. Paul says, Greg, 
First, thank you for always acknowledging and responding to posts on X. Uh, do you make it a part of your routine to listen to other podcasts from NFC South teams? I don't. It's funny. It's like I'm. Uh, I I don't have so much. I only have so much time in my day usually. So podcasts, I feel yeah. like I'm very much. I've gone from like a 1.2 podcast guy to a 1.5 podcast guy. Oh wow! It's almost helium at that point. Um, <laughs> but. But I know I, I still do it. So no, I, I listen to a lot of league podcasts. I, I can't say I listen to that many uh, NFC South specific pods. I read a ton. Um, there's some really good writers on this beat with all three teams um, out, out there. There are in Tampa too. Don't get me wrong, but um, I, I'm I'm not there on a daily basis. So I'm right. very much at the mercy of uh, guys that I really respect in Atlanta and, and Charlotte and New Orleans and read a lot of that. That I'm kind of seeing things vicariously through them. And uh, you'll have that where it's, it's like, I think I'm pretty understood what this means for the Panthers. But I mean, if I read Joe person on it, uh, if I read Mike K, I feel like I thought what they thought about that, that's fine. And in Atlanta, it's the same way. Mike Rothstein's kind of moving on into a different role, but Mike was great there. Uh, D led is a guy who's covered the Falcons forever, covers them. Uh, New Orleans has five or six people that I like there that I read a lot. So again, not podcast necessarily. And then I'm yeah. not always, um, I always feel like I, I'm a, I'm a, impatient podcaster um in that i'll, I'll like like forward, forward 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 like you're clicking forward i hear that i do that too um <laughs> now, yeah, hold on i think they said something. they're actually talking about what i want to hear about there yeah. the back, the back. <laughs> you probably spend as much time you're just dancing forward and back um yeah. but like i said i'm kind of an impatient podcast listener um but no, i probably should um this is the time of year where uh i, I feel pretty good about understanding where teams are draft wise uh, not like third day draft wise by any means, but like the most important picks. Uh, hopefully I'm not too surprised by things on draft night. It's a little bit crazy in that you're, you get through they're They're kind of bunched where again, I'm going to get to eight. I'm going to see what they do. I'm going to try and be covering that. And then the time it takes me to write something short on Dallas Turner, boom, the saints are going to have a tackle hopefully at 14. Um, and then you get through that and the bucks are 26 and then the Panthers are picking twice. So, uh, yeah, like I said, it's fun. Probably should listen to more podcasts. If you guys have uh, podcasts you want to recommend on the other three teams, uh, I'll definitely try and listen to those and add that to my schedule to uh, build up my my week suits in the in the division for sure. Sounds good. Well, like I said, Greg is one of the best in the game. You could check out all of his work on Fox Sports, and your social media is at Greg Almond. So uh, just your name. I'll throw it up on the screen again for anyone that's not already following. So after you follow Greg, make sure uh, you please follow us on all of our social media on X, Facebook, and Instagram at Peter Report and our YouTube channel is Peter Report TV. Please like and subscribe. This has been a great episode. More to come this week. We're doing a seven round mock draft tomorrow. And then we got our old pal Trevor Sykema joining <laughs> us on Thursday. So a little Peter Report reunion. And next week, we got a Bucks player on. So Ross A. Dennis should be on, I believe, on Tuesday. We're going to have him. So great episode today. A lot more to come. And stay tuned at pewterreport.com. Greg, thank you so much for your time. You, you were fantastic. That's going to do it for us on today's show. For Bailey Adams, for Greg Allman, I'm Matt Matera saying thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you tomorrow for another edition of the Pewter Report podcast. Oh, thanks, guys.